The Holy Gospel according to Luke. Glory Glory to you, O Lord. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to Jesus. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. Which one of you, having a hundred sheep and losing one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? When he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders and rejoices. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who need no repentance. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one of them, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? When she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so, I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. So, in the last month or so, especially the last few weeks from our Gospel readings from Luke, we've heard quite a bit about banquets and dinners, those kinds of celebrations. And of course, even in the Gospels, Jesus is no stranger to the invitation to a good dinner celebration. A couple of weeks ago, as he gathered with a group, and they were all your more elite folks in society, at the end of the meal, he turns to the host and tells the host that he's invited the wrong people, that he should be inviting those who will never, ever be able to repay him instead of inviting the people who he knows a week later might invite him to a dinner in return. Now, in the last couple of weeks, all we've really done is move from chapter 14 in Luke's Gospel to chapter 15. But in that amount of time, we can see and we can hear in our reading that that Jesus has been living out what he's been preaching, because the Pharisees and the scribes are unhappy. They're grumbling, Scripture tells us, because Jesus is welcoming sinners and he's eating with them. Oh my goodness. He's welcoming sinners, he's eating with them, something that no self-respecting rabbi or teacher or even faithful Jew would be doing. Now, as a parent, you've probably said this or maybe you heard this as a kid, but I know it rings in my ears. You need to be careful of the company that you keep. You need to be careful of the crowd that you run with, right? Because if you run with the wrong crowd, you might just get yourself into trouble. And it's true. But Jesus was certainly not running with the right crowd, at least not the right crowd according to the religious leaders of the day. But he was running with the right crowd in the sense that he was running with the crowd that needed to hear his message most that needed his presence, his forgiveness, and his invitation most. Our parables this morning, they come to us from the beginning of the chapter, of 15th chapter in Luke. And they're just the first two of a series of three, and the third one being the story of the prodigal son. It gets its own week. But each story is about something that's lost, or at least it would appear to be about something that's lost. And yet our readings today about a coin and about a sheep aren't really about a coin and a sheep. These passages, these parables, are about Jesus' relationship with sinners and the celebration that ensues and happens when one of God's precious creation is found or restored to a community of faith in God. Those sinners that Jesus welcomes and eats with, they are indeed the point of the parables, the point of the passages we heard from Luke this morning. They're the takeaway of Jesus' teachings in the gospel today. As Jesus tells these parables, we need to remember who his audience is in this moment. 
It would have been an interesting place to be able to teach and preach at that moment because Jesus is talking with the people that he's been eating and dining with, those sinners and tax collectors, and yet we also know now he's addressing this group of Pharisees and scribes, the religious elite. And so he has these people on both, both sides of the coin, if you will, those religious elite and the outcast, the one that they were upset about being included. He begins both of our parables this morning with the question, which one of you, which one of you doesn't leave the 99 in the wilderness to go and find the one that is lost and then put it on your shoulders and carry it home and throw a party with all of your friends? We never hear if he actually stopped on the way back to grab the other 99 to take them home as well, or whether they're just still wandering around out there somewhere in the wilderness. Or the second part, which one of you doesn't light a lamp when you lose a coin, meticulously sweep the whole house? I mean, sweeping the whole house doesn't really happen in our house more than maybe once a month or so. Nobody likes to do that, right? That's not a commentary on Danielle. I'm the one that does the vacuuming. I promise. I promise. But who, who doesn't? Which one of you doesn't light a lamp, meticulously clean and search the entire house to find one coin? And then when you find that coin, you throw a party that probably costs more than that coin was worth to begin with. It's the absurdity of the question. It's the, the, the premise of it that is the hook of the story. It's what draws us in. Because we know that the logical answer to both of those questions of which one of you is no one. No one does that. No one leaves the 99 sure things to go off and look for one thing that might already be gone, only to risk losing some of the others. No one tears the whole house apart looking for one precious coin, only to turn around and spend that and more on a party. No one would go to that extent to reclaim that one small thing. But that same absurd, over-the-top, almost reckless nature is also the point. Because no one does those things except for God. These parables aren't about Jesus or somebody's lack of concern of the nine coins the woman still had or the 99. It's not really about them. It's about the lengths that God goes to to reach the lost, that God is continually looking for the lost in order to bring them, in order to bring us back, back into a relationship with God. So in our parables this morning, we hear that even those who are lost mean something to Jesus. And maybe even especially those who are lost mean something to Jesus. The good news this morning, and and it is good news in this passage, even if it makes us uncomfortable, is that the sinners that Jesus invites to the table with him, they're now not who they used to be. They're not who they used to be because of Jesus' invitation, because of their experience dining at the table with him. He no longer sees them. He never saw them as convicts or criminals or the tax collectors who were the Roman puppets who cheated their own people in order to make their own wealth. No longer was this group of sinners and tax collectors considered to be an outcast, an outsider kind of group. No longer did they, he deem them to be unclean or despised or untouchable. In Jesus' example, no longer should these groups be looked down on or mistreated because Jesus has invited them just as Jesus invites us. Jesus has found this this group of sinners that he was dining with from time to time, this group of sinners and misfits, and they are never the same. Jesus' parables also remind us that this celebration, this, this repentance, this turn of events of people turning back to God is something worth celebrating when it happens. And that even the angels rejoice in heaven over one sinner, one sinner who repents, one person who is found and comes back to God that there is rejoicing like never before. That's how much God loves each one of us as broken and sinful people. 
Luke's gospel goes a long way to include people who were the least, the last, the lost, the lonely in society. Shepherds and women, sinners and tax collectors, even just in our story, they all had an important role to play and an important place in Jesus' kingdom. It also becomes obvious when you look at not only his dinner companions of the sinners and tax collectors, but when we look at the parables, each of the dining celebrations that happen in response to that that being found, those meals are ones attended by the least and the forgotten in society. The shepherd who was on one of the lowest rungs of the, the social ladder, when he gets home, who does he invite? He doesn't invite the social elite. He invites his friends, probably fellow shepherds and other people on that same rung of the ladder to celebrate. They're the ones that come to the invitation. And the woman who finds that lost coin, she, if she only had that many coins to begin with, she's not among the elite either. And so she invites the neighborhood women and the neighbors to come and celebrate and rejoice And they were just as unseen and undervalued as she was in that culture. Even today, Jesus continues to invite sinners to come to his table. We'll hear that invitation in just a little bit. Each time we are invited to worship, each time we come to worship, we are invited as guests at Christ's table. Gathered together and we celebrate the sacrament of Holy Communion. What we have to remember is that as we accept that invitation, as we are sinners who are invited and gathered and we too are changed, that that invitation isn't just for you and for me. It's also for the people today who are outside of our walls, who are the least in our society. That invitation is for the homeless and the poor, the immigrant and sick, the outcast, the imprisoned, and the forgotten. They're invited to take that place at the table right next to us. Right at the beginning of our gospel text this this morning, we hear that they're upset. The leaders are upset because this fellow welcomes sinners and eat with them. Thank goodness. As Christ's followers, it's something that we should strive to be doing and to live by as well. Our invitation to come to Christ's table to experience God's hospitality and kindness, compassion and forgiveness, it's not reserved just for us or the people that we are most comfortable with. In Jesus' ministry, he sought out the lost. He sought out the lonely and the people who were outcast in society. And Jesus calls us to do the same with grace and love, with an invitation, we are called to minister to the people around us, those people who sometimes need God's love as much, if not more, than we may in that moment. The good news is we will always be counted among those sinners and tax collectors, those people that Jesus is is happy to dine with and to invite to the table. We are a part of that group as God's children, and we should count ourselves lucky for the invitation. But it's just as important for us to seek God's people who are still lost and forgotten and to celebrate and rejoice when they are found. Our goal should be not only to understand that we have a place in God's kingdom and at God's table and in Christ's church, but so do the people around us. Our parable started this morning with the question, which one of you? And it's kind of an absurd question, but it's still the question that I think Jesus is posing to us this morning. Which one of you? Which one of you, which one of us will go the extra mile to reach out to one of God's lost today? Amen.